The Selfish Gene, Chapter 13, The Long Reach of the Gene, by Richard Dawkins. Dawkins admits that this selfish gene theory encapsulates a tension between the gene and the individual body, which is further explained in his book, The Extended Phenotype. On the one hand, there is the independent DNA replicator jumping down the generations, living as immortal coils through disposable survival machines. On the other hand, the individual body is integrated and united in purpose, coordinating a single-minded brain in the cooperation of senses and organs. Previously, we have discussed how individuals maximize chances of passing on their genes and make economic calculations for genetic benefits. And from the gene I view, a concern for reproductive success and its relatives. Darwinian selection does not work on genes directly, but on their effects, the phenotype versus the allele, usually on embryonic development and therefore bodily form and behavior. Genes are successful if the environment influenced by all the genes has a beneficial effect on a shared embryo, making it more likely to develop into an adult and reproduce. Most genes have more than one phenotypic effect. What is good for one gene is good for all, the whole body. In the example of a gene that improves the running speed of a predator, which helps it survive. However, some genes exert beneficial phenotypic effects, good for itself, but bad for the rest of the genes. This process is called meiotic drive. The process of meiosis is usually fair, on average, Half the sperm or egg contains one allele, and the other half contains the other allele. Mutant genes called segregation disorders, or as geneticist James Crow termed, genes that beat the system, acts on meiosis to make one allele more common and therefore spreads across the population, even if this is detrimental to the other genes and bodily welfare. One example is the T gene in mice, where inheriting two genes i.e. the homozygous state, leads to dying young or sterility. Male mouse with only one T gene will be healthy, but 95% of the sperm will contain the T gene, leaving only 5% with the normal allele. Natural selection favors segregation disorders, and the gene will spread quickly in the population. However, individuals will start inheriting two genes, and this will lead to the extinction of the population. Although not all segregated disorders are so destructive, most have adverse consequences. The net effect of bad effects on the body and good effects on the gene is all bad. Dawkins says biologists tend to take for granted the existence of individual organisms as a large, coherent, purposeful machine, instead of asking why living matter groups itself into organisms in the first place, or why ancient replicators assemble survival machines and live inside them. He warns of the error by some biologists in thinking that DNA is simply a device used by organisms to reproduce, like an eye is a device used by the organism to see. To address this misconception, Dawkins turns to the concept of extended phenotype, which looks at the phenotypic effects of a gene as all the effects it has on the world, instead of simply limited to the individual body. Examples of this would be beaver dams, bird nests, caddis house, and spider webs. The caddis fly larvae live in the bottom of the riverbed and stick together stones, sticks, and other materials to build itself a mobile home as a protective covering for its vulnerable body. The caddis house is an adaptation of evolution, much like the hard shell of crustaceans. Natural selection influenced the larvae behavior, with genes indirectly controlling variation in caddis houses, hypothetically for the stone shape, stone size, stone hardness, etc. The stone hardness is an extended phenotype of the caddis's genes. Extended phenotype effect can also be from the genes in one organism on the body of another organism. Shells of parasitized snails by fluke flatworms are extra thick and seem to benefit the snail by protecting it and prolonging its life. Then why don't snails evolve to have thicker shells anyway without the parasite? 
This is because snails that spend more resources on making thicker shells are penalised by devoting fewer resources to reproduction and therefore do not pass the genes on for making extra thick shells. Flukes do not stand to gain from the snail's reproduction, but gains from influencing the snails to protect itself and live longer. Hence the fluke's genes shows extended phenotypic effects on other organisms. Other examples include the protozoan parasite, Nosema, that manufacture chemicals of the host flower beetle larvae, preventing it from turning into adults. Larvae grow into giants twice the size of normal adults where Nosema parasites can continue to live. And this giantism is an extended phenotype of the Nosema's genes. Similarly, the Saculina, a creature related to barnacles, parasizes crabs by sucking nourishment from its body and castrates the crab's testicles and ovaries, leaving the crab to divert energy away from reproduction. If parasites enter and exit through reproduction, over evolutionary time, it may help the hosts to survive and reproduce, and ceases to be parasites, and potentially merging with the host's tissues. This mutualistic relationship can be seen between the wood-boring ambrosia beetle and the bacteria or fungi parasites, or the chlorohydra and the algae that act like one organism. Hence, our genes cooperate because they share the same outlet via the sperm or egg. In contrast, the fluke shares a different exit than the snail and remains separated into two distinct entities. Fragments of DNA, such as viroids or plasmids, may live freely outside chromosomes, especially in bacterial cells. Plasmids that contain only a few genes can cut, splice and jump in and out of chromosomes. Viruses engineer ways to help it travel from one host to another such as through colds, bodily fluids, or airborne transmission. Dawkins argues that viruses may be the collection of breakaway genes transmitting from body to body via unorthodox sideway routes. Beaver dams probably evolved to protect the beaver's lodge from predators and allowed it to transport trees. Beaver lakes can be over several hundred yards long and are extended phenotypic effects of beaver genes, no less than the genes on beaver's teeth and tail development. Cuckoos living as parasites in the nests of reed wobblers and manipulate the behaviour of its foster parents can be considered extended phenotypic behaviours by the cuckoo genes. Cuckoo nestlings act on the host's nervous system like an addiction. Dawkins likens this to a man aroused by printer photographs of a nude body in that the nervous system is responding the way it might respond to a real woman, instead of the flawed explanation that a man is fooled into thinking that the printed ink is a woman. The red gape of the cuckoo entices other birds to drop food into the mouth of baby cuckoos in stranger birds' nests instead of feeding its own young. Cuckoo genes have phenotypic effects on the colour and shape of cuckoo gapes, and the cuckoo genes have extended phenotypic effects on hosts' behaviours. So why hasn't natural selection allowed the manipulated foster parents to evolve resistance? One explanation is that selection needs more time to adapt. Dawkins, however, argues that in the evolutionary arms race, there is a built-in unfairness and asymmetry in the cost of failure. Cuckoo nestlings that failed as parasites would have died and hence their genes for failure to enslave foster parents cannot be passed down. In contrast, foster parents perhaps never encounter cuckoos and those that were enslaved probably still lived to rear their own offspring and hence genes for failure to resist enslavement were passed down. Dawkins and John Krebs dubs this the life dinner principle referencing one of Aesop's fables. The rabbit runs faster than the fox because the rabbit is running for his life, while the fox is only running for his dinner. Furthermore, resistance to manipulation, for example, needing bigger eyes or bigger brains, may be costly to reproduction and never be passed down. Cuckoo-like insects such as Bothriomimex regicides and Bothriomimex decapitans are two ant species that parasitizes other species of ants. As young ants are fed by workers, 
The parasite manipulates the hive by cutting off the head of the host queen and is adopted by the orphan workers who then tend to her eggs and larvae. The new workers eventually replace the original workers and then gradually replace the species. In the Monomorian Sanctuary, the parasite queen mind controls the host workers through a chemical process to murder their own mother queen and perform her other deeds. Likewise, the caterpillar of the butterfly Thesbe Irenea has a sound producing organ on its head for summoning ants and produces nectar that binds ants to be its bodyguards. The ants go into an aggressive state for several days and attack, bite, sting any moving objects except the caterpillar. Natural selection has favoured genes for manipulation to ensure its own propagation and these genes can be said to have an extended phenotypic effect. Dawkins therefore states the central theorem of extended phenotype as an animal's behaviour tends to maximise the survival of the genes for that behaviour, whether or not those genes happen to be in the body of the particular animal performing it. Hence both the genes and individual survival machines have complementary and equally important roles. In contrast, groups of animals do not share an exit because individuals can gain by competing against each other, whereas all genes in an individual animal are aligned because they exit through the egg or sperm. A beehive behaves like a single vehicle because the future of the genes is vested with one queen. But why do genes create large vehicles with only a single bottleneck genetic exit route? Why do genes cooperate to make large survival machines to live in? Dawkins theorizes that initially replicators cooperated to form cells to facilitate the complex chemical processes for producing proteins. Cell wall and membranes were useful to keep chemical intermediaries together and acted as a production line system. Cells combine into multicellular organisms to better compete, differing in size, fighting or defensive abilities, mobility, etc. Our cells, for example, are clones of each other and contain the same genes, but different cells specialize or differentiate for different tasks. Bottleneck reproduction firstly allows for complex organs to arise from simpler ones by going back to the drawing board and starting again. Secondly, provides an orderly timing cycle calendar to regulate embryonic processes. And thirdly, in the event of mutations, allows more cellular genetic uniformity of daughters given a common ancestor than other reproductive processes like budding. Hence bottlenecks and individual organisms may have evolved together and mutually reinforce each other. Living organisms bound by bottlenecks into discrete unitary organisms are more likely to concentrate their efforts to ferry shared genes through the bottleneck to the next generation. Dawkins ends by emphasizing the replicator as the prime mover of all life. Some varieties of these replicators have become extinct, while other varieties gained new tricks and have come to dominate the population. Replicators survive through both their intrinsic properties and their consequences on the world, which affect the replicator's success to get itself copied. Replicators that are mutually beneficial will gang up to create discrete vehicles cells and later multicellular bodies. Bottlenecked life cycles and discrete vehicle-like bodies eventually prospered. Hence, replicators are not simply tools of individual organisms, but vice versa. In conclusion, Dawkins reminds us that the gene's phenotypic effects extends beyond the individual body and manipulates the external world, radiating a web of extended phenotypic power. The only entity for life to exist anywhere in the universe is the immortal replicator.